Good morning and thank you for joining NSBA for today's conversation on regulatory policy. I'm Molly Day on staff with NSBA and I'll be handling the back end moderation of this webinar. I'm happy to kick it over now to our fearless leader, Todd McCracken. Thank you very much and thanks to everyone who's joining us today to the uh, NSBA 2021 Small Business Congress or at least the regulatory policy portion of the, of the Congress. Um, it's my pleasure uh, to, to first introduce to you the 2021 chair of NSBA. Um, I'm really pleased that ML Mackey, who's the co-founder and CEO of Beacon Interactive Systems in Massachusetts, uh, is, uh, is both our chair and joining us today. Uh, they're a, a small business delivering digital technology to the Department of Defense uh, and doing it in new and innovative ways every day. Um, uh, ML has come to us after being very active in the New Small Business Association of New England, uh, now the New England Business Association and the National Defense Industry Association, and of course our own Small Business Technology Council, uh, NSBA. Uh, NS, uh, ML has always been pragmatic and visionary in putting policy over politics and, and has helped us make uh, or continue our tradition of bipartisanship uh, uh, a key part of what makes an SBA unique and effective. Um, that makes her a really great person to lead these discussions and, and, and lead the organization. So I'm gonna turn over to ML and she's gonna tell you a little bit more about uh, this event, what to expect and why this is so important. ML, thanks for being here. Thank you, Todd, for that warm introduction. And thank all of you for joining NSBA today and for all the future sessions you'll be joining us for. NSBA is a nonpartisan, member-driven with 65,000 members in every state and industry. We ask that all questions be submitted through the Q&A panel, not chat. We are leaving the chat open, but please be mindful that they can be distracting, so, so chat expeditiously. <laughs> I'll remind you that today is not about business development or networking with each other for business development. Today is about coming together to collaborate on ideas in order to inform legislators and policymakers on the realities of the small business experience. We need to articulate what is useful and what is not in describing that experience and its legislative impacts on that experience. It's the only thing we're coming together to discuss today. I don't know about the rest of you, but it is quite a relief. Every day I wake up as a small business owner and have to think about business development. And in this brief moment, I get to collaborate with like minds and be thoughtful and purposeful about doing something and advocating for the greater good. Treasure this time as I do. Value it as a collaborative discussion in order to bring a true small business voice forward. It is and has been my honor to serve NSBA that way. And it's a real pl pleasure to work with the board and the leadership council. I'm very happy to share this time with you and my, my cohorts kicking off this session, Todd, who you've heard from, the NSBA president and CTO. I'm going to introduce you shortly to Tamika Montgomery, a board trustee here at NSBA. A little bit about the Small Business Congress, though, before we hear from Tamika. It happens every two years. It is how NSBA decides our priority issues for the coming two years. I love this process. I appreciate how it is truly membership driven, what we, what issues we choose, and what positions we take to advocate for. Typically these sessions occur in person and back-to-back -back meetings over a day and a half, maybe two days, but this year we're doing it for all of the reasons of this year and pivoting and flexing to a new opportunity as challenges are often seen by small business entrepreneurs. We're doing it as seven webinars over a three-week span. The priorities we've developed today are, think of them as a guiding star. They're not written in stone. We have the ability to flex on our position as we come, become more informed. We also have the ability to flex as new issues arrive, but this sets us with a here our mission in a couple of different areas. So our agenda for today is first we hear from the experts on the issues, then we get some time to ask questions about the policies. And then we'll get a read on how all of us on the session are feeling through some informal polls that Molly will run. And then finally, we vote on the priorities. I will take a moment here to let you know we have a couple of great experts lined up for us today. I'm very much looking forward to the conversation. I'm especially looking forward to hearing from David Purton as he was at NSBA when I first came on board. And quite honestly, I became quite spoiled and comfortably accustomed to the level of insight and detail that David has the wealth of experience to provide. You're all in for a treat today. I'll also point out that our issue committees at NSBA play an important role in helping us develop and fine tune our position on these issues. If you wanna be more involved in these committees, please email Merrill Tiemann. And in terms of the Leadership Council, I can remember the discussions we had when we stood up this group. 
We created the Leadership Council in order to proactively and purposefully bring to the board a wider and more inclusive reach across both disparate geographies and industries. It has been an overwhelmingly positive experience. I'm so pleased to have all of you Leadership Council members on this call with us today. So with that in mind, I thought it might be interesting to hear from one of our new board members, Tamika Montgomery, about her experience previously engaging with NSBA and the Leadership Council and now as a board member. Tamika runs Core Strategy Partners in Maryland, an economic development insights and strategy consulting firm. There's been an interesting path, Tamika, with you to the NSBA board. First, she was on the NSBA board as part of one of our affiliate organizations, the Denver Metro Chamber of Commerce. And then she was a presidential appointee at the Small Business Administration during the Obama administration, leading the Office of Entrepreneurial Development. Then she came back to NSBA, first on the Leadership Council, and is now back again on the board. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to you, Tamika, for, for your thoughts and comments. Thank you, ML, and thank you, Todd, and everyone, for this opportunity to speak. So the, the, the Leadership Council. So I'm honored to be able to kind of make that gradual transition, as you mentioned, because the Leadership Council in general provides all of us as members a unique opportunity to be small business leaders and to be a critical link between national policy and locally elected officials. Um, and particularly in my case, I'm in Montgomery County, Maryland, had a great opportunity to connect with my local county um, um, councilman to really offer some feedback on what he might consider doing that would really help to, to um, allow local small businesses to thrive, such as mine. So the, the Leadership Council really encourages us to be more actively engaged and to, to, be, to develop greater and deeper within NSBA and just within policy in general. Most of NSBA's 30 member board of trustees, which I'm proud to be a part of, became engaged through the leadership council, such as I am, um, before being elected to the board. And then finally, what I wanted to share with you is that, you know, the, this council really provides a unique opportunity and exclusive opportunities for us as business owners to this particular forum and other media opportunities to really help shape an SBA policy. So I encourage you to really take advantage of the opportunity to engage with an SBA because you really don't know where that path will lead you. And, you know, that path could lead you to serve on <coughs> these or it could lead you just to be more deeply engaged in your local community, um, shaping policies for small businesses. So thank you. I'll hand it back over to you, ML. Thank you, Tamika. I appreciate your thoughts. So now I'd like to introduce you to Bill Belknap. He's going to talk to us about policy. He is the chair of our regulatory committee. He is the CEO and president of AEONRG LLC, a Pennsylvania-based business providing maintenance, repair, and operation MRO services to support the Veterans Affairs Medical Centers, the National Cemetery Administration, and other federal and state governments. Bill is a West Point graduate who served 20 years in the Army. Thank you for your service. He's an active member of Chester County Chamber of Business and Industry and the Chester County Economic Development Council for more than 15 years. This is an aspect of the NSBA leadership I think you will find across the board and that we all participate regionally and then also engage on a national level with each other. Just a wealth of experience. He's been, Bill has been active with NSBA for years now. He's in his third year serving on the board. And as the chair of our regulatory committee, well, I'll say this is a complicated area, and it requires that purposeful, steady, and thoughtful leadership to get through what can be very involved conversations. With a concerted effort to reduce adverse regulatory burden on small business, we always need to balance and temper our feedback with practical understanding of the larger industry and government impacts of our recommendations outside of the small business experience. Bill has this experience, both regionally and at a national level, to lead the development of the clear measured voice that NSBA is so well known for. Bill, in more straightforward terms, I appreciate your thoughtfulness to not throw the baby out with the bathwater. <laughs> <laughs> With that, I will turn over the discussion to you. Very Thank you, Almel. Thank you for your kind words and uh, tar on target thoughts about uh, how NSBA uh, continues to be the premier champion 
uh, of an advocate for small businesses. I am constantly reminded of a construct that I learned uh, while getting my MBA many years ago uh, that uh, left alone large businesses would stifle small businesses with their significant resources and lobbying um, and wherewithal to pursue small business opportunities to stifle uh, competition and stifle small businesses uh, if, loan, if left on their own. So the need for small businesses to unite for advocacy uh, is even greater uh, today than ever. Um, and uh, I, am, uh, I know that NSBA continues to be at the forefront for advocating for small businesses. I want to turn your attention to the, uh, uh, the briefing packet uh, that, that you have received for this um, uh, seminar. And some of the topics in there are Beneficial Ownership Corporate Transparency Act, which I'll get to in a little bit more detail, uh, Regulatory Reform and Paperwork Reduction, uh, Strengthening the SBA Office of Advocacy, uh, political reform, uh, OSHA regulations, and also tort reform. A lot to cover on all of those topics. So what I would like to do, I think would, would be helpful was to, is to start the discussion uh, before we turn it over to our experts on highlighting uh, one in particular, and that is uh, beneficial ownership uh, or more official terms, the uh, Corporate Transparency Act. NSBA has been at the forefront for fighting for small businesses for um, a pur purposeful resolution of this, um, basically, uh, NDA, uh, National Defense Authorization Act passed and was signed into law in December of last year. Uh, the new law is part of a annual defense spending legislation, but it requires a certain li uh, legal or limited liability corporations uh, inform the Treasury's Financial Crimes Enforcement Network of their so-called beneficial owners and establishes a private database for those names. It's important to note that large companies are, primary, are mostly exempt from this Corporate Transparency, Transparency Act. And so our belief is that uh, since it uh, covers uh, those companies with fewer than 20 employees and over uh, less than $5 million in annual sales, it really adds another um, uh, burden to small, uh, small businesses. It's, a, uh, it's been a long, important, uh, issue for NSBA and one that, as I mentioned, uh, provides extra cost and legal risk for companies and one that we want to continue to, to attack to um, make it more fair, if you will, uh, bottom line. And most recently, when uh, Secretary Yellen was uh, at her confirmation hearing before the Senate Finance Committee, uh, she noted that it was to her an important problem and that uh, she found it uh, a very high priority to enact. So we do expect that uh, uh, regulations, uh, more definitized regulations will be coming out and you can bet that NSBA will be at the forefront on commenting on those uh, regulations. So with that, ML, I'll turn it back over to you. All right. I think I'm, I'm fumbling the pass here. <laughs> <laughs> is this one the right? I'm more of a ballerina than a sports person, but is this where you call a timeout for a moment while I get myself organized? <laughs> well, you know, did I, did, I, did I pass the football to the wrong place? Should it be tied? Sorry. Oh, no, I'm hoping it was your mistake, but I think it might be mine. <laughs> I know you're wide open, but sorry about that, Todd. <laughs> <laughs> so, Todd, if we could hand it over to you just to okay. cover my fumble, that would be awesome. <laughs> I appreciate it. Uh, yeah, I just want to take a couple minutes. I can introduce our, our uh, guest today. And then I also wanted to, to sort of though, talk about the implications of a uh, of a, uh, uh, survey we did at the end of the year that for purpose of our discussion here. So I'm going to do the survey description first. Um, so Molly, if you wouldn't mind uh, bringing that up onto the screen so you can sort of see the results. I'll be, I'll be pretty brief. But I think there are some telling, some telling data in here. Uh, uh, for uh, for uh, this discussion today, and as we did the survey of 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 both members and non-members of the small business community uh, uh, right at the beginning of the year, and so initially we asked them, you know, have they feel about the future of their business right now, just to get a level set for everybody, um, and you know, only a few of them um, said that they were feeling uh, 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 relatively. Uh, um, uh, confident about their business. 
Um, so we asked them what it, what were the uh, kind of most significant challenges in the future of the growth of their business, and it's not surprisingly, all of them related to the to the to the situations we find ourselves in today economically. So economic uncertainty obviously was the top concern. The the pandemic was the second, and the third is decline in consumer spending. As we can see, all of those are interconnected with one another, and and uh, uh, are are all about the times in which we live uh, that are being driven by the pandemic, but when it gets to governmental policy, the very next concern is regulatory burdens. So as you can see, it, it, that's, that's, that's ranked higher for both members and non-members, higher than available capital, than the federal tax burden, and the lack of qualified workers, all of those things that we think of as being significant burdens for the small business community. Uh, so regulatory burdens were at the very top of that, which, which uh, yeah, is our topic for today, obviously. And then if we looked at uh, the, on the next uh, question, what were sort of some near-term priorities? Uh, again, a, a close second was improve access to capital for companies, but the top concern was to avoid knee-jerk regulatory burdens, uh, because I think a lot of small companies are seeing a situation where as a way to resolve these issues, uh, government might just ask business or tell business to do a whole bunch of things that smaller companies are not always equipped to do. Um, so I think there's a significant fear of that. So we'll talk about some of those things today as well. So um, uh, I think I'll stop with the survey results. All that's in your packet. You can, you can review the results that you're uh, at your leisure. Um, and I want to sort of get right to our discussion, really the, the, the meat of our session today. So I'm going to introduce our speakers. It's really, uh, I'm really happy to introduce a couple of old friends who are, who are gracious enough to join us today. Uh, the first is Tom Sullivan who currently is the uh, Vice President of Small Business Policy at the Chamber. Uh, but I have known Tom for, for many years, and I, I met him when he actually um, uh, it was, was in charge of regulatory policy for, for another small business organization. He then became, for virtually all of the Bush administration, the Chief Counsel for Advocacy at the Small Business Administration. And the primary uh, role of that office, or a primary role of that office, is to be sort of the regulatory watchdog for the small business community and to keep sort of keep track of what's happening and, and make sure that the agencies who are imposing those regulations are, are held to account. Uh, so, uh, Tom, thanks for thanks for joining us today. Uh, our other other guest is, is David Burton, who currently is a senior fellow. Uh, for economic policy at the Heritage Foundation, but immediately before that was general counsel to NSBA, uh, and we're, we're, we sort of miss David's work here every day because um, uh, he had his fingers in, in lots of critical issues from regulatory affairs to to uh, uh, capital access and, and all the rest while he was here, and he's continued those uh, those things there. And, and, and prior to being at NSBA, he had it had his own startup for uh, a, a Alliance for uh, Retirement Prosperity. Uh, has had his own public policy firm, uh, the Argus Group, and uh, and many years ago also ran the uh, Chamber's Tax Policy Center. So he's an expert on tax policy too, of all things. So uh, so uh, uh, thank you, gentlemen, both for being here. And uh, maybe I'll just sort of start off with uh, sort of some big picture stuff. Uh, I mean, when you look at the at the level of regulatory concerns that our members, non-members express. Do you think that's right? Is, is, is the, is, are the burdens that may be imposed or are already being imposed by the government the, the place where they should be the most worried looking forward to the next year or two and, and why? Tom, I'll, I'll start with you maybe. Well, thank you. Thanks, Todd. Um, and thank you to the whole host of folks who are, who are hosting this. Um, and, and I, before I answer the direct question, I just want to thank NSBA in particular for two things. So first of all, is to have a session that is on something other than PPP. So thank you. Uh, <laughs> the, other, the other is just a sincere thank you to NSBA for being such a vigilant supporter uh, for the office that I was honored to lead for several years, and that is the Office of Advocacy at the Small Business Administration. I suspect we'll talk uh, a great deal about that office and the importance of that office, but uh, I don't want anyone uh, to leave at least my comments without knowing that NSBA has been historically a tremendous uh, supporter, defender, um, and advocate for that office. And uh, I think the discussion that David and I will have this afternoon 
uh, may actually uh, emphasize the need for that right now. So as far as your survey uh, revealing that regulatory issues are top of mind or knee-jerk reactions that unfortunately will have unintended negative consequences to small businesses, uh, I think it's dead on. Uh, it's dead on because we know the roadmap. Uh, the roadmap from an all-democratic administration and Congress actually uh, is in, in front of it. I use a, a roadmap uh, in the sense of the old days when we didn't have GPS. You know, you, you lay out in front of you and you see the route that you've got to go. But if you look at uh, 2016 and you look at uh, the National Federation of Independent Businesses um, biannual review of the top concerns of small business. Regulation at the end of two of President Obama's terms was the highest it had ever been in the 40 to 50 year history of polling small businesses about concerns. Um, the top slot was, uh, was healthcare, uh, accessibility and cost of healthcare, and maybe we'll get a chance to talk a little bit about that because that had been the top concern for 40 straight years in a row. Uh, and then regulation had kind of crept up, but le leapt all the way up to the number two concern because of a number of things, perhaps some of them we'll, we'll talk about today, that kind of had a increased pressure throughout the terms of how the federal government regulates business. And then many of the folks on this call, and I, I suspect it was in your briefing materials, you know that any regulatory mandate impacts small businesses mm -hmm. disproportionately. So roughly with, with uh, the U.S. Chamber Foundation's research that we've done on this, it's about a 20% greater regulatory burden on small businesses than the general average. And perhaps David will get into this uh, in, in more detail, but we're, you're looking at an average of, if you take manufacturing, for instance, $35,000 per year per employee to comply with federal mandates. And again, you're looking at businesses with fewer than 50 employees having close to 20, and depending on what sector you're in and what, what regulatory issues you're talking about, you're going to have either 20%, sometimes it's as high as 75%, more of a regulatory burden on the smalls compared to the larger counterparts. Now, this isn't because someone in the White House off, in a White House office wants to hurt small businesses more than large. It's simply a scale. So I, I like to think of it, Todd, you probably taught me this kind of this, this picture, is that it's as simple as a husband and a wife sitting down at the kitchen table after the kids have gone to bed and looking at spreadsheets and material about how much they owe for taxes. And then even if they're using an outside CPA, it's their signature or the wife who owns the business, it's her signature on the return that matters. So those late evening hours, or maybe they're an early bird, and those early morning hours spent trying to figure out all the complexities of the tax code are costs. And it just simply costs the female CEO who's at the kitchen table more than if you had a big corporation with an accounting department that is, running, that is able to kind of scale out those same types of costs across a larger organization. And so that's, that is the difference of the small versus large. And so when you look at the roadmap that shows in a democratic administration, your costs are gonna go up, then small businesses uh, have the most to fear, the most to lose, unless some of the tools that we'll talk about are fully utilized. And NSBA certainly is best situated to utilize some of those tools, but I just wanna whet the appetite for this discussion of what some of those tools might be. Thanks, Tom. Actually, before we get to, to David, I'd like to do, a, a, since you raised these issues, I'd like to do a quick poll of the participants to ask them some questions about what you just said. Uh, and then maybe David can respond to that as well, the survey. Uh, Molly, if you wouldn't mind putting up, asking people what the most burdensome areas are of regulations right now. 
for companies. And uh, you can choose three of these. So tell us which three of these areas from payroll to environment related are the ones that, uh, that you have the most trouble with. Uh, we'll take just a second here and let people choose that and, and then we'll, and we'll get the results and, and, and get some response to it. But I think this could be, you know, helpful to focus our discussion a little bit. Um, and uh, uh, I have to add again that uh, unfortunately, if, you're, if you have signed on to Ring Central through the web browser as opposed to the app and having downloaded the app, unfortunately, you can't take the poll. But unfortunately, most people, as we, as we told you in the emails, uh, registering. I think have downloaded the app. So, Molly, are we almost there? We're still seeing some movement, so we'll give it another right. couple of seconds. Looks like things are slowing down. Let's give it five more seconds and then we'll close it. All right. Well, so interestingly, uh, payroll employee compensation were the, were the highest, followed though very closely by uh, uh, taxes, uh, tax-related uh, regulations, and then healthcare and health insurance, uh, which can be uh, uh, um, really puzzling for people sometimes. Um, and then second, I'm going to get at, of course, it doesn't matter to the business owner, but some of these regulations are from the state government, some are from the local government, and others are from the federal government, and some are an overlay of those. Uh, so we'll, let's let's talk about that in a minute too. But but David, give us your your lay of the land, what your response is, both those uh, uh, polling results, but also uh, what you see moving forward. Oh, you're muted, I think still. Okay, can you hear me now? There you go. We can hear okay. you now. Good. Yeah. So in terms of the scale issues, you see that effect in a lot of industries. I mean, you see it in the financial sector in terms of the number of community uh, banks and the utter dominance of the largest 10 banks of the deposits. You see it among uh, broker dealers or investment banks, the huge decline in the number of, uh, of, of broker dealers, especially small ones that help small companies raise money. Uh, you see it in terms of the number of companies listed on the stock exchange declining by almost half over the past 20 years. Uh, you see it in, in a lot of other fields, uh, including uh, health care. I mean, a lot of small uh, medical practices are closing because they simply can't afford to comply with the rules and so on, on down the line. I mean, local hardware stores are almost dead. It's, it's, uh, and it, it's because there's a disproportionate adverse impact on small firms and also because the regulatory burden is a barrier to entry to new companies coming in to the, to the company. I think the problem is about to get substantially worse. Uh, on Inauguration Day, President Biden signed three executive orders relating to the uh, rulemaking process, all of which are designed to make it easier uh, to impose new rules and uh, make it harder for the, uh, well, the OIRA, the Office of Information Regulatory Affairs at the Office of Management and Budget to uh, limit the rules or kick them back to be rewritten because of the burden they impose. Uh, OIRA traditionally, uh, going back uh, at least to the Reagan administration and also very much during the Clinton administration, played uh, an extremely important role in sort of being the same players in the regulatory process. They're the ones that conducted the cost benefit analysis under various presidential executive orders, including Clinton's 12866. Uh, they often informally as the rules were being drafted, uh, made the agencies uh, adjust the rules so that they were less burdensome. Um, made them pay attention to things like SABRIFA or the Paperwork Reduction Act. Uh, a lot of that is about to go away. Uh, Biden's uh, executive order called Modernizing Regulatory Review, for example, uh, makes it clear that uh, intangible benefits uh, have to be accounted for 
uh, and that uh, it, OIRA can no longer play, quote, a harmful anti-regulatory or have deregulatory effects. So they, they basically are going to try to repurpose OIRA uh, to be, uh, so that it's no longer a break on costly regulatory initiatives, but that it affirmatively promotes it. And in fact, there's language in the executive order that ask OIRA to be proactive and help the agencies uh, draft new rules rather than be a barrier to the most costly rules. They did not entirely jump the cost benefit process, but they set up all the, the requirements to in effect be able to evade it. And, and I think you'll see that, that have an effect. In terms of the timing of it, uh, the Biden people generally are going to be competent. They're going to understand the Administrative Procedure Act, how to run a rule, how to get it through the process, uh, where the landmines are, uh, unlike the Trump people who didn't understand the process. And uh, I suspect you'll start seeing these rules roll out uh, in, uh, in all the agencies relatively quickly. Uh, and probably starting in about uh, seven or nine months once they're fully staffed up. And <clears throat> they have a long backlog of rules that they, they want to win at. Uh, another th you know, thing is the Trump people uh, bragged about their deregulatory efforts. And there were a number of executive orders that Trump uh, issued that had a constructive effect. Uh, his famous, although poorly drafted, two to one uh, executive order, and also the one that uh, placed the limit on guidance documents and other ways of, of writing rules without going through the process. Uh, all those were repealed uh, by uh, a Biden executive order. And also all Trump rules that were in process have been frozen. So. And then I suppose the last thing I'd say is that the Trump people bragged about their deregulatory efforts, but they exaggerated that like they exaggerated a lot of things. Uh, they probably got rid of about 10 to 15 percent of the rules that came in in the Obama era. Uh, and that was it. And most of those came in the final year of the administration. Um, there are exceptions, of course. But so we're going to start from a fairly high uh, level of regulation and I think see it grow pretty substantially. Okay. So. Th thank you very much. I really, I uh, appreciate that. So all of David's remarks come from, uh, uh, talked about OIRA and the fact that OIRA might not be the same uh, uh, traffic cop for regu new regulations that it has been in the past. That strikes me that it means the the SBA Office of Advocacy in that role might be more important than ever. Uh, then because because that office is charged with playing a unique role, looking at the burdens of of regulations on small businesses. So Tom, having been in that job, uh, what can you tell us about what we should expect from that office? Now, we've just had a situation where we've gone the entire four years of the Trump administration with no uh, permanent Senate confirmed chief counsel for advocacy. Um, uh, what does that office need? What resources does it need? What authorities does it need to, to, to do its job the right way? Well, thank you, Todd. Well, first of all, it needs an NSBA. Uh, that's, that's an easy one. Um, and you may, you may wonder, well, you know, why? Um, the answer is that, that whoever is the chief counsel in this administration uh, is going to have a heck of a harder time than, than I ever did because I served under an administration that wanted to be as deregulatory as possible. So uh, when I would point out things that they could do a better job related to small business, I generally had a, a fairly friendly audience, although I like to say that I was six foot two with jet black hair when I took the job and then I look like I do now. Uh, I'm sitting down on a webinar, but I'm about five, six, and I have gray hair. So uh, I, I like to say that, that um, the things that were not public were the things that kept me up at night and gave me gray hair and perhaps shrunk my stature. Um, 
And it's those private conversations that are the toughest for any chief counsel. So that, that gets to the point of what do they need? What do they need to do what actually um, Daryl DePriest and Winslow Sargent were able to do under the Obama administration? So let me give you a couple of examples to give some optimism, even though we know that it, it's, we're kind of like a fish swimming upstream here with a, we can expect a, a great deal of regulatory controls coming down on the small business community. And there are some unique situations coming out of COVID that um, can be a little bit more alarming than that, having to do with the immense um, help and federal aid that has been presented to try and help the small business community. It is logical that a greater regulatory set of controls by the federal government will follow that aid. So, um, but what, what NSBA and the small business community can take heart in is that there, there, there was uh, the Jobs Act that was signed into law by President Obama actually strengthened SBA's Office of Advocacy. Uh, the Office of Advocacy uh, is empowered to comment on how rules will affect small businesses and hopefully prompt agencies to consider less burdensome alternatives publicly. So they, they share this information. I, I like to call it the, uh, the coach's um, flag on a football uh, field where the coach throws the flag and, and everything stops and then the referees and others kind of review what's going on. The Office of Advocacy actually has that power to throw that yellow flag in there, call kind of a, a timeout for everybody to step back and realize how a regulation might impact small business. Now, the Jobs Act that was signed by President Obama actually requires agencies to respond publicly. And some, some of us might think, well, so what? What's the big deal? You know, Office of Advocacy says this is going to stink for small business. And then the agency says, oh, yeah, you're right. It is going to stink for small business. Like, so what? What happens? Well, here's the important part and, and the strength of NSBA and other business and advocacy organizations. Once there is a public acknowledgement that, A, there is a disproportionately high impact on small business, and B, the agency responds that's where NSB, NSBA comes in with two important roles. First of all, data. The next chief counsel for advocacy needs data from NSBA. I mean, Todd, you're nice enough to take live time polls right now during this webinar. You have polls and surveys leading up to this webinar. Data that show impact to small business who are trying to recover, trying to help America recover from the pandemic that's what's going to arm Office of Advocacy with the type of ammunition it needs to push back at a federal agency that is, has uh, proposing a regulation with unintended negative consequences. The second part, though, which some would argue is even more important, is coming up with alternatives where an agency can meet the underlying goal of the regulation without the burdens. And I, yes, I'm, I'm a little bit biased, but I, I repeatedly had seen those solutions come from your members, Todd. They don't come from someone who is a public servant and, and spends uh, the time writing rules and regulations. They come from small business owners who say, oh, well, you want to reduce, uh, you want to reduce pollution from a diesel tractor. Well, um, you know, the federal government wants to for everybody to build a bigger engine that has all these types of pollution controls over it i'm just a small business owner who makes engines uh that john deere uses and i know that the john deere hood has to fit over the engine so making it just bigger with a bunch of pollution controls isn't going to solve the problem but what is going to solve the problem is if you phase in that requirement of lower emission diesel tractor engines over a period of 10 to 15 years, the technology will actually evolve so that the pollution controls get smaller and smaller and more affordable by small businesses. At the end of the day, you have a win-win. That type of solution comes from 
NSBA members. It, in fact, in my, it, during my tenure, it did come from an NSBA member who was uh, building agricultural um, uh, you know, uh, engines for tractors out, out in the Midwest. And so to get data into Office of Advocacy is critically important. And then to provide um, business-based, less burdensome solutions is that second task. And once you arm the Office of Advocacy with that information, you can actually accomplish some pretty mm -hmm. tremendous things. I, I, was, I noticed that David Burton uh, talked about um, raising, the companies raising money. Another kind of success story in, uh, in the Obama administration with the Office of Advocacy was uh, in the crowdfunding space. I'm not sure, Todd, if you remember this, this uh, involvement, but basically smaller issuers who were doing an offering of less than half a million dollars because the small business community said, whoa, whoa, whoa wait a minute. We, we don't have the money to do audited statements here. D the data convinced the Office of Advocacy, which in turn convinced Securities and Exchange Commission to, to allow smaller issuers to just have reviewed financials instead of audited financials. And it's that type of thing. They didn't make the, the regulation go away but they made the end result less harmful to small businesses. And that same type of approach can be utilized in the years ahead of us. Thanks, Tom. Uh, Bill, I don't know if you want to jump in with anything here, but I kind of wanted to also get our, our, um, our guest views on which particular areas we should be most watchful for. I mean, obviously, the uh, uh, bill talked at the beginning about the beneficial ownership rule that passed the Congress over the winter. Now there will be some regulations promulgated to enforce that, uh, and it'll bring new regulatory burdens, even though it didn't originally come from the uh, regulatory action, onto these small business owners. Um, uh, so that's one really prime example of things we're going to be yeah. watching for. But what are others that are that are we should be watching for? We've we've heard about OSHA, maybe getting some uh, additional authority or, or or being asked to uh, come out with some new things. What else? Todd, Todd, um, I, I would love to hear from some folks who are on the webinar some comments about what type of rules are going to make it harder to hire your next employee. I am convinced that once we pass this pandemic, small businesses are going to be trying to scale up. And so we've got to certainly be hypersensitive to any federal rule that makes that next hire more difficult. Yeah. Well, I think that you'll see uh, regulatory initiatives at virtually every agency, the Department of Labor, the National Labor Relations Board, the Environmental Protection Agency, FinCEN and Treasury, uh, there'll, there'll be changes on the tax regulations. Some, uh, and, and you know, it's virtually endless. The some of it will be done legislatively, but one one of the structural problems we have in the federal government now is that Congress has written most legislation so that tremendous discretion has been given the uh, the executive branch agencies and the independent. Uh, agencies. So, uh, you know, there, there's just a tremendous amount that they have the authority to do, particularly when combined with the court's deference, so-called Chevron deference, that they give to agencies' interpretations of the statutes. So you're, you're going to see, I, I think, major regulatory initiatives on the part of virtually every agency in government. Uh, you talked a little bit about beneficial ownership reporting, and as Todd knows, I spent a lot of effort trying to stop that, and unfortunately, we, we failed. Uh, it, it ended up uh, getting included in a 1,500-page piece of legislation called the National Defense Authorization Act. Um, and that's going to impose uh, a, a substantial additional regulatory burden on small businesses and almost exclusively small businesses because virtually everybody else uh, in, in, uh, uh, got themselves exempted. So banks are exempted, uh, accountants are exempted, uh, uh, 
large corporations are, are exempted. The only people who are really subject to this rule are firms with uh, both 20 or fewer employees and under $5 million in, um, uh, in gross receipts. Now, this is, there's, there's a long, sad history here. There was a lot simpler way to do it by just letting FinCEN look at forms already filed with the IRS, but that, they didn't want to do that. Uh, and that was primarily because the people really pushing this were on the Financial Services and Banking Committee, not on the Tax Rating Committee. So congressional jurisdictional dispute is the primary reason we have this. Uh, but you, and you know, you, you think to yourself, ah, okay, I'll just report who my owners are, but owner doesn't mean owner. <laughs> owner, a beneficial owner is anyone who exercises quote substantial control, all right? So that can be someone who isn't an owner, but has substantial control over a company, for example, an officer uh, or uh, uh, any, anyone who's close to an officer or a controlling shareholder. And the rules haven't been written yet. Uh, FinCEN's going to write the rules, and we obviously need to try to make the rules a little bit less crazy than, than they probably will be. Uh, FinCEN is uh, the agency within Treasury that, that uh, controls the anti-money laundering rules, and if you are deemed a financial institution, uh, which, of course, includes people who aren't financial institutions, like car dealers, jewelry stores, and so on, um, then you, you have some sense of the complexity that those rules can give rise to. Uh, and, you know, just to sort of remind you that we can't ignore these rules, the fine for not filing the proper forms with FinCEN, once this is up and running, are $500 a day. If you're Exxon, A, you're exempt, be $500 a day isn't that big a deal. If you're a small business, $500 a day is a big deal. Uh, and you know, my guess is a very large percentage of small businesses won't know they're obligated to file these forms. Uh, for existing businesses, the requirements kick in two years after the regulations are finalized. Uh, so you know, we're probably talking uh, two and a half, two and three quarters years before existing businesses do it. Newly formed businesses will have to comply with the rules as soon as the rules are finalized. Well, that's very helpful. Bill, do you have a comment? Yeah, I, you know, it strikes me as, <clears throat> excuse me, as a, a small business owner, and certainly I, I do a lot of work with the uh, <clears throat> uh, federal government, so I am uh, very attuned to the numerous uh, regulations in implementing my, my business, is that, um, what, what's uh, what's most helpful is how can I put this for the the uh, federal government not to automatically assume that uh, we are small business owners are the experts in that new regulation being implemented. So what what, what do I mean by that? What is most helpful is that if, uh, if there's an inquiry uh, about uh, enforcement, then understand the entire picture uh, where that where that company is, facilitate them being compliant. So I think that's a huge opportunity for the government to be of service to, to small businesses, which is to facilitate them being compliant um, instead of assuming that they are, quote, experts and uh, automatically, you know, quote, throwing this uh, regulation at them, um, uh, distracting and, and not very helpful to, uh, for a small business to operate as, as efficiently as it could. Yeah. Uh, well, we have been getting a few uh, uh, questions coming in. I'd like to sort of see if we can turn to some of those and get folks involved in the discussion a little bit more. Just a reminder that if you do have a question, make sure you use the Q&A uh, icon at the bottom of the screen, uh, not the chat, because that's where we're actually wondering, looking at uh, Q&A. Jody Milanese, who's our uh, Vice President for Government Affairs, is kind of been watching the, the questions. So I'm going to turn over to her to sort of uh, uh, pull those out and, and, and get them asked. So, Jody, thanks for doing that. Sure. Um, so in response to the question that Tom posed to the to the group, I've seen a lot of um, responses come in about the federal minimum wage and the impact that that has had in uh, various states. I've seen responses from Maine and Illinois, um, where the cost of living is very different depending on where the business is located in the state. And then as well as uh, the mandatory uh, paid 
time off uh, rules. So I don't know if either one of you have any comments on either of those, but those are, uh, those are some things that I've seen come in um, based on the question you asked, Tom, about being able to hire and, and compete with those larger uh, businesses. Well, there's legislation in Congress to do all of those things, and uh, there, it's likely to pass. Uh, the, uh, the the minimum wage bill, the, the mandatory pay time off. There's going to be a whole host of of uh, changes to the union organizing rules, um, and I, I think that you are likely to see a total remaking of the uh, employment laws. In addition, uh, the uh, DOL and the National Labor Relations Board will use regulations to push the envelope on those fronts for trying to, for example, narrow the category of independent contractor uh, and broaden who must be an employee. Uh, so, there, there's going to be tremendous, a tremendous push uh, to substantially change those laws in a way that uh, helps union organizing, uh, places restriction on employers with respect to protected concerted activity, uh, places restrictions on employers' ability to engage outside contractors instead of hiring employees and, and so on down the line. Um, Marilyn asks, should the office of the National Ombudsman be independent and strengthened to find and highlight existing regulations that were well intended, but are overly burden, burdensome for small businesses? Hey, Jody, this is, this is Tom. I, so I, I mean, this is certainly up, up to you all. Um, and this is certainly the reason for for you having this uh, biennial summit um, to come up with policy positions. In my humble opinion, the ombudsman should be merged with the Office of Advocacy. That should be, actually, it should be independent. The reason is because you just don't want an office grading the rest of the federal government when they have no independence. I, I think it, it calls into question the veracity of the grading system. Um, and I, I, I think both offices do great, great things, but uh, having personally experienced and headed an office that is independent, there's, uh, there are some positives to that. And that one of the greatest positives is they're, they're able to be transparent in a way that isn't subject to the spin of the political uh, administration. Uh, preparing for this panel, I went through the last seven years of the Office of Advocacy's annual report. It's all there. It's all written out in, a, in as objective a manner a, as possible. I don't think you see the same type of transparency from the ombudsman's office, not because they're not trying hard, but because their reports and their grading system of how other agencies are helping businesses comply are edited and written by the administration without the type of independence that gives uh, an objective view that allows NSBA to do its job and advocate on, uh, on all of your behalf. So that's a long way of answering is that it should be independent, should be merged with Office of Advocacy, uh, and you'd have, a, you'd have a better off watchdog for small business because of it. Thank you. I, I think it would be prudent if we, if we spent a little time talking about the uh, Corporate Pr Transparency Act and beneficial ownership. I have seen a couple of questions come in on that. Um, folks mentioning that they had not previously um, known about this reporting requirements. Um, what platform would I even submit these annual reports? And then even asking, um, 
that they believe they are already required to update and submit annual representations to their respective Secretary of State Corporation Commission. So wanting to know if it would be um, prudent to get the Secretary of the State Corporate Commissions to add a beneficial ownership form to uh, you know, to their annual reporting than to add another layer to the same information twice. So um, maybe we can just spend a little bit time talking in a greater detail about the what has transpired, what these new requirements would be, what it means for small businesses, and maybe get some of um, some color around this issue. The initial version of the Corporate Transparency Act, in effect, piggybacked and added requirements on the state secretaries of state and state corporation commissions, all of which have different rules, and all of which opposed basically being conscripted by the federal government uh, for, for this purpose. Uh, so now FinCEN is going to be the one that runs this effort. Uh, and FinCEN will issue rules that tell you how you have to do it. Uh, and they haven't done it yet. I mean, it's no surprise that the legislation only passed in December. But probably by somewhere April to June, FinCEN will put out proposed rules, which presumably NSBA and me at Heritage and others will comment on. Uh, uh, it's important that small business owners comment on those rules if you want to try to make them less bad. Um, and Typically, the people that are commenting on federal rules are not small business owners because they actually have better things to do than read the Federal Register at night. But uh, on this one, it, I think it's important that the small business owners get engaged and comment. Uh, but that that's it's it's going to be a function of FinCEN. You're going to be filing forms with FinCEN. You're going to be subject to penalties by FinCEN, uh, and it'll kick in for existing business owners two years after the, the final rules, or the rules are finalized. There's a process, they put out a proposed okay. rule, then the public comments, and then there's a, a final rule. I'll just say a couple of things real fast. One is the fence that David mentions is the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network as part of the Department of Treasury, just for folks who don't know that. Secondly, there's already legislation to repeal this requirement. It's gonna be a long, tough uphill slog to, to think about that, but, but we're already advocating for that with a coalition of other organizations. Uh, so this is definitely an issue I think that's gonna be with us for a while. But ML, I think, ML Mackey, our chair, had some things she wanted to add about this as well. So ML, do you have some comments on this? Yeah, I would just like to add a couple comments from the, the how to most effectively advocate for this. What I have found in the years of working with NSBA and, and the years before that with regional associations is that if you come up against something that is so, I find the impacts of this legislation somewhat draconian and really dangerous for small business owners. So if something is that egregious, why is, why are the people advocating for that legislating legislation going for it? What? It, why is those that are opposing us so so adamant about doing it? So I think it's really important that when we advocate, that we very purposefully understand the position of someone else. Many times I have found in small business advocacy that it is not about that draconian impact on us that they're looking for. That's just an inadvertent. Um, impact of an otherwise pretty high ground kind of intent. So the idea of making sure that we have visibility and we don't have bad actors washing money through through our, our, our game is really an important thing to address. So two things, one I would say, please pay attention to why those oppose, oppose us, oppose us. And two, Tom, I, I really liked what you said about um, the practical bring it forward, solve the problems, make sure that we don't just tell them what's wrong with this. I mean make sure we tell them what's wrong with this because there's a lot wrong with this but also tell them and here's an idea or here's a suggestion or or let us work with you to craft so that you can meet this honorable and laudable goal that you're going for in a way that isn't what did you say um david you said inadvertent i wrote it down i looked at disproportionately adversely 
impacting small business. So I just, as we advocate for things, sort of keep that in mind, pay attention to those opposers and be constructive in our, our suggestions. One, one of my great frustrations about this entire process is I told countless members of Congress and even more staff, there's a simple way to accomplish your result that, without uh, harming 12 million small businesses. And if most of you probably have passive entities, so, but on the K-1s for S-corporations, partnerships, LLCs, you list all the owners and then issue K-1s to the owners. If you're a C-corporation, you pay dividends, you pay 1090, you generate 1099s, right? So all the ownership information, higher quality, more comprehensive ownership information is sitting right there on the IRS computers down the hall at Treasury the metaphorical hall, it's actually one building over. But the bottom line is all that information, better information is already in government computers. All they had to do was authorize the financial crimes network part of treasury to look at the IRS part of treasury and they could have the information. But nobody cared about that because all the guys pushing this were on financial services, not on ways and means or on banking and not uh, uh, finance. It, it's one of the most disgusting exercises I've ever seen in, in Fenson pushing it behind the scenes and lying about it. And then uh, the, the Congress having a jurisdictional spat that resulted in 12 million small businesses having well over a billion dollars in additional compliance costs. That's what just happened. And it was, again, typical of Congress. It wasn't separately debated and voted on. It was rolled into this must-pass 1,500-page monstrosity of a National Defense Authorization Act that they dumped all kinds of ancillary stuff in that had nothing to do with defending the country. Yep. It's hard to disagree with, all, with that. So. Aside from, I mean, obviously this is going to be a huge issue for us, is a huge issue for us, both in educating our members as the, as the requirements roll out and figuring out what exactly they have to do, but also in trying to ameliorate that burden or getting it, uh, getting it rolled back. So um, I think that's likely something we'll be working on as an organization. But what are the other agencies we should be paying attention to? Uh, Tom, do you have any views on, on specifically what those should be? I, I think it was mentioned earlier, uh, I think by Bill. Um, that at every agency, if you're not successful in stopping or making less burdensome, you've got to immediately follow with the insistence of easy to understand educational right. and compliance materials. Um, because, I, I mean, Todd, if, if, if you get confused reading a Department of Labor proposed regulation, then the rest of us are in a heck of a lot of more trouble. Uh, so across the board, that shift towards really insisting on the education and compliance assistance is going to be necessary. Um, I, I think, and again, I, I'm looking at kind of post-pandemic where you see small businesses trying desperately to scale, to grow, to get past the survival mode. I think IRS is, you know, you gotta, you can't ignore IRS. Um, and, and, and I should say there, there actually have been, you know, in the Obama administration, I view a major victory for small businesses, the simplification of the home office deduction, mm -hmm. you know, that, that, and I know that NSBA was certainly behind that. So mm -hmm. getting at ML's comment is that, is that don't, don't feel as though if, if things are stacked up against you, don't feel as though your voice doesn't matter. It's actually, I think, the opposite. You're more important to have that voice now than ever before. So IRS has got to be paid attention to. Um, and anything that has to do with hiring that next employee, so that is uh, primarily Department of Labor and all of the iterations there. And then let's not forget any regulation that has to do with health care because it, you're going to be, the smalls are going to be competing against the bigs for the best employees. And once you get past minimum wage, because there's different kind of classifications of what employees look for at a minimum wage level, they want to know how much am I getting paid, period. 
quite frankly, very little else based on data, very little else matters. Once you get above that into a, a management component at businesses, then benefits make a big difference. And if healthcare is too far away, not affordable, not accessible for small business, then they're not going to be able to compete with the big guys for the best employees. Thank you very much. Uh, Jerry, uh, other big questions that are remain unanswered uh, that we need to give people before we let our guests go on their way? Um, yeah, I think we, we could um, find some few from you, few more questions that people have submitted and commented on. So um, Sheila mentions, uh, David, you had talked about uh, background checks. And uh, she agrees with you completely on what you said about not, uh, you know, being able to ask candidates if they um, have committed a felony or have a criminal report, you know, putting her business and safety of employees in danger. And uh, just curious if you've heard of any likelihood of any changes to this or flexibility, um, any rules that may be coming out um, for the employers on this, uh, on the background check issue. Yeah, uh, I'm pretty confident that eventually the uh, it could be both DOL and uh, NLRB that would go down this road. There's also a decent possibility of uh, legislation on it. Typically, the legislation simply prohibits the use of background checks uh, and uh, in, in certain contexts, for example, hiring. Uh, but doesn't solve the problem of if you don't do a background check and then you hire someone who then goes to a customer's home and commits a crime, being held liable for not doing a background check, right? So uh, it, it rarely uh, covers that problem. It prohibits you from doing something to protect your business and your customers, but then holds you liable if it doesn't work out. So. Uh, that's the kind of thing that is likely to happen. Uh, it would be good if we could have uh, clear rules uh, where it was clear what the business needed to do with respect to background checks, credit reporting, and that sort of thing. Uh, and then if they're, they're uh, protected from liability for not doing the things that are prohibited by law. Um, but that's not what's likely to happen. What's likely to happen is prohibitions on certain things, uh, certain kinds of background checks in certain contexts or credit checks in certain contexts. And then the business is nonetheless held liable for not doing the background checks in other cases like a tort suit in uh, state court or, or what have you. And maybe we'll just, uh, one final one, which is very sort of open-ended and would love to hear your thoughts from Michael. Do you see a way forward in resolving partisan uh, divergence? The current to toxic environment is not conductive to business or public policy. Yeah, I, I, I do. Um, I, I mean, so um, I, I think there's absolutely a way forward. It, it, it's about building the governing middle. Um, we have a fairly aggressive lobbying team up on Capitol Hill, and the head of that group uh, said the most remarkable thing. Uh, he's a man of a few words, but after uh, the events of, of January 6th, he, he simply commented that it took a long time to get here, and it's going to take a long time to recover. And so from the U.S. Chamber's perspective, we are, we are putting a ton of effort both financially from a PAC perspective, as well as uh, other, other ways to try to reward those uh, brave members of Congress who are reaching across the aisle to get things done, whether that's the Problem Solvers Caucus in the House or uh, depending what sports season you're in, I think right now they're calling them the Sweet 16 uh, group of, of senators. We've got to look for those moments to applaud what those centrist governing members of Congress are doing. Let the press like drag them all through the mud all the time. But we, I think as a business community need to really hone in on the positives where folks are taking courage to do something with it in a bipartisan way 
and reward that from the, the type of spotlight that NSBA and other business organizations are doing. And I think that that's the path forward. I think that rewarding, incenting, talking about these positive moments, not only give us hope going forward, but actually give those courageous uh, members of Congress even more courage to act in a bipartisan way moving forward. Right. No, I guess I, I mean, I, I have some thoughts on the matter, but the, the bottom line is our politics has become increasingly divorced from reality, increasingly divorced from facts, uh, increasingly dominated by Twitter feeds and TV talking heads. Mm -hmm. And we need to try to move our politics back to a more substantive uh, reality based politics. Uh, if, but I'm not sure I'm an optimist that that's going to happen, yeah. but that's what we need to try to do. Yeah. Well, on that uplifting note, uh, thank you both for joining us. I, I think we're a little bit past our time when we said we would keep you, but thanks very much for, for sharing your wisdom and knowledge with us today. Um, so thanks a bunch, David and Tom. Glad to be able yeah. to help out. Yeah. Bill, do you have any concluding thoughts? Uh, I'm just going to say that it's an excellent dialogue, and um, uh, I'm, I'm reminded that uh, uh, from my military background, uh, offense uh, is, is part of the way to win, if you will, and to help shape things versus being uh, versus uh, defense. And so, being out in the forefront, which NSBA continues to be, is, is helpful. And uh, perhaps there's a way that uh, we can be even more proactive uh, in the future. Uh, get in front of these issues before you know they, they uh, sometimes they snowball into bigger and, and more difficult to solve later on but uh that that's a great discussion today more to follow and uh yep. you know, we'll, we'll keep on uh, moving forward all right appreciate it and thanks thanks for all your help and leadership on these things too uh, now we're going to move on to sort of get some more feedback from for you all uh in terms of what priorities ought to be um, I'm actually going to invite uh, ML and, and, and Tamika to get back on the line with us and, and talk about stuff. Um, uh, but we want to do a, a, a little bit of a, of a check with uh, the, uh, you all and, and get your sense of priorities. Uh, but first, I'd like to sort of turn it to Tamika and ML and get your reaction to the discussion overall. Tamika, why don't you go? Great, great. Yeah, no, it's interesting because um, I think one of the things that I want to say, ML, that I really appreciated um, what you said was really understanding both sides of the issue and understanding what the um, what the arguments or what the concerns may be on the opposite side. And so um, it was interesting for me to kind of listen in on this from kind of the, the viewpoint that I had in working mm -hmm. closely with um, Winslow Sargent, right, as the ombudsman or with the gentleman, and his name is escaping me, who was, I'm sorry, the Office of Advocacy and the gentleman who ran um, ombudsman at the time. I think what this, what I learned from it, one is I'm going to be um, doing a little bit more research on the beneficial ownership because I want to understand that that better, um, both sides of, of the issue and tr truly trying to understand what what they're trying to get to with it. So that's something that um, I'm really concerned with and finding out. And then I had taken, um, there was another thing that was said that I thought was really interesting with respect to, um, you know, how do you, how do you strengthen the, off the, the, the ombudsman's office? That was something I participated as a speaker with the office of ombudsman and really um, am interested in figuring out how do you raise, how do you use that as a stronger voice? Mm -hmm. Because I do feel like the voice of the ombudsman's office does kind of get diluted. Um, and a lot of small businesses don't really know about the office of the ombudsman and what that office is, is, is for and how it could be used to raise up issues and concerns. So that was something else that I think, um, so I'm curious to see who's going to fulfill that new role. Um, but I think most importantly, that whole diversity of thought and coming with some real solutions is going to be really important for all of us. 
Yeah, I agree. I was really struck by also uh, you're, you're thinking about your comment about why are why are folks doing this. One of the best examples I thought from the discussion is is the background check piece. I mean, there are it doesn't appear apparently just to a small business owner who thinks they need to do this uh, to, to to keep their business and customers safe. But there are real reasons why why uh, we might want to think about uh, uh, challenging the 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 status quo on the background chat piece, right? And so we've got to figure out how can we achieve some of those goals by not arbitrarily excluding people from, from real opportunities while also giving those businesses the chance to, to sort of um, uh, be free from that liability. So maybe there's a creative solution there. Yeah, can I, um, I do think like, and I had put this in the comment, I mean, there are a number of companies that have done a really great job with opening up pathways into their companies for people who have those barriers um, by, you know, either reducing um, the, the, the background check, but then also, you know, they've not had a, a significantly kind of a, a significant increase in terms of, mm -hmm. Kind of criminal or or danger to their team and staff so i think there's some opportunities there as well to kind of see both sides okay all right well let's uh i have a 115 so let's sort of sort of get to a little bit of voting here um and we're going to sort of get your sense of what what the highest priority should be sort of in this regulatory arena and again just remind folks the feedback from this session is going to go forward to our to our culminating session on February 23rd, where we're going to sort of look at, in a broad way, uh, all of the all of the um, um, uh, uh, priorities for the small business community. Um, as we get to that, I also want to remind that we have two more of these sessions uh, coming up. Uh, one is on 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 capital access and economic development, which is tomorrow. So uh, register for that if you haven't already and make sure you participate with us. And then on Thursday, we're going to, to look at trade and technology issues. So, so there's lots of really interesting things there also for folks who so get signed up for that and sign up for the February 23rd uh, event as well. Um, so Molly, if you wouldn't mind putting up our, our, uh, our priority poll for folks who want to get their uh, input here before people have to go on with their day. I know there's lots going on. Um, here's a lot of things we talked about. So, uh, one is, is repealing the beneficial ownership rule. That's the one we talked about, I think, at some length. The other is regulatory reform and paperwork reduction. And that gets at the issue that, uh, that I think David Burton talked about, which is, the, which is how regulations get developed and promulgated in the first place. Um, you know, what is the role of the Office of Management and Budget in holding the agencies to account, the, the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, uh, and designing an overall system that gives incentives to the agencies to, to keep the regulations efficient and as, and as uh, unburdensome as possible while achieving their goals. Uh, third is to strengthen the Office of Advocacy at the SBA that we talked about at some length also. Um, that, that's a unique office in the, in the SBA. Their only job is, is to advocate for the small business community on, on regulations and, and, and important policy matters, and they do a lot of research as well. Um, and they are designed to be independent of the administration, even though the head of that office is appointed by the president, that they are designed to operate independently from the, from the administration. And then there's political reform, which falls in this category as well. It's the it's the bipartisanship. The, 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 how do we get to a to a to a more reasoned discussion politically, uh, and what are the incentives for that? And then OSHA regulations, and one we probably didn't spend enough time talking about today, which is tort reform, uh, getting a handle on our overall legal system and its impact that it has. Um, and all candor, I, we don't hear as much about that issue from the small business communities we used to, probably because there are other priorities. But it nevertheless is an issue that falls in this category. So what I would like people to do is take a minute, uh, again, if you've downloaded the app, and sh tell us which of these three um, uh, is the highest priority for you, um, uh, for us to, to, to act on and to forward to the overall um, uh, Small Business Congress culminating session on February 23rd. Um, so take just a minute, and then we'll we'll look at the results and chat about them just a little bit.
It does appear the voting is slowing down, so let's give it about 10 more seconds. All right. All right. Well, I'm curious now what you think of this. We have, uh, from the results we have now, the, 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 the one that gets the highest ranking is regulatory reform and paper production, which, which makes a kind of sense because that's the overall systemic reform that will get us to sort of uh, lower levels of regulation and uh, wiser regulations overall. Cuts across everything. But uh, it's also, I think, remarkable that strengthening the SBA's Office of Advocacy is, is a fairly close number two. Um, and that's, that's in line with something we've thought for years. We, this association argued for the creation of the Office of Advocacy back in the 70s. Milt Stewart, who was a former chairman of the board of, of, of this association, was the very first chief counsel for advocacy, as a matter of fact, uh, at the SBA. So we've had a long and, and close relationship with that office, and we would like to see it be much more uh, uh, strengthened and effective. And then number three here is, is, is dealing with the beneficial ownership rule. Um, and uh, uh, I want to make clear, because there was a question in the comments about what that exactly means. You know, we would like to see the overall rules imposed by Congress you know, repealed. That doesn't mean there's not room for, as David Burton outlined before, there to be some attention to gathering some information to, that, to help cut back on money laundering and other things. There are, there, are, there are bad things that happen out there. There are reasons that people want to have a rule like this. Uh, but, the, but the path they've gone down is, is overly burdensome in a, in a myriad ways for the small business community and there are, all, there are better alternatives and we want to make sure those are addressed. And now, what do you think about this? What, uh, do, uh, do you have any reactions to these things I just ticked off? I do. I have the first overall reaction that I always have when we have these kind of discussions of what an informed group and a thoughtful discussion it is. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would like to add a point on each of the top three. One is on the regulatory piece and reducing regulatory bur burden. I, I again want us to all hold true to um, being purposeful and thoughtful about what regulations are good and what regulations are overly burdensome. And that is a more uh, demanding and thought requiring conversation than just which right off our regulations. Bill, I'm so glad it's why you're very purposely and clearly leading this committee. I'm, I'm looking forward to your, your steadiness with that throughout the year. The second thing on the Office of Advocacy, absolutely, we need to make sure that we're supporting the Office of Advocacy. We also need to make sure that not only can the Office of Advocacy make calls. Bill, I think you said a little bit about what you learned in the military was a bit of an offense as a good defense. What is the stick when there is clarity from the Office of Advocacy versus the carrot of, oh, this is all small business and we're doing great. What is the challenge if the Office of Advocacy calls out someone? And we need to be thoughtful about that as a continuing impact. And the third thing around beneficial ownership, and I really would like to remind everyone on the call that all politics are local. And the best thing that you can do around beneficial ownership is to go and speak to your local members in their office, well, you can, nobody can go into their office now, but you know what I mean, in your, your district representation, that you talk to your local papers, you talk to your local colleagues who are small business owners, and you make sure they understand how challenging this beneficial ownership legislation is, and that you do it with that measured voice of NSBA, and with the understanding and the comprehension of the good intent, but with a more purposeful and a collaborative approach, like David Burton described, there is a way to manage both the need that the legislation is going after and remove that risk and danger to small business owners and entrepreneurs. So again, I'll just reinforce all politics is local and go with the content that Todd and the staff puts together. One of the things that always always impresses me is the, the clarity of the one pagers, the issue briefs that the team comes up with. So walk into those conversations with what you can share and offer that quality content that NSBA puts together for you to advocate with. Well, thanks. I also want to sort of just take another minute to, to thank our speakers and to thank Bill uh, for your time and thoughtfulness and helping us put this together today. Um, and I, again, remind folks that we do have two more of these issue sessions coming up this week on Wednesday and Thursday. So please register for those if you haven't. Uh, and then the final culminating session next week on the 23rd. 
Um, I also want to thank our primary sponsor, which is Ring Central, uh, who not only has helped us do this financially, but has uh, helped us with the platform itself. Um, and I just want to mention that we're going to be having a, a webinar with them on March 3rd to help uh, all of us, including you, uh, uh, learn and understand and better utilize these tools. So uh, we hope you all can join us for that also. So uh, I think that's all for me, ML. Uh, any, any final thoughts before we send people home? No, we're good. Well, thank you all. Thanks for joining us. And hopefully we'll see some of you tomorrow. Uh, thanks for all your input and help. Appreciate it.